Yeah, uh, hi everybody. Uh, welcome to this talk with uh, um, Amrit Robbins and Nikhil Saralkar from Axiom Cloud. Uh, they are respectively the CEO and CTO of Axiom Cloud, which is a company that works on uh, what they call apps for refrigeration. Uh, they are helping grocery chains manage their refrigeration equipment to reduce energy bills, uh, reduce emissions, and do predictive maintenance using IoT, AI, and automation. Uh, I'm personally very uh, excited for this talk uh, because refrigeration improvements involve like some of the, they involve several at the same time of the most impactful solutions according to Drawdown, which is uh, energy efficiency, HFC, gas leaks, and food waste. So it's like a triple whammy, uh, sort of a no-brainer that people should work on this. Um, now, uh, a little bit of logistics. So this event is uh, hosted by uh, Work on Climate. Uh, I know that uh, we usually have attendees from outside the community. So for people outside the community, we are a Slack community that helps people uh, work on climate as professionals using their professional skills through a variety of programs. Uh, come join us at uh, workonclimate.org. I'm Eugene. I'm one of the founders of the community. I'll be facilitating this event. Um, one more thing, we record almost all events uh, and post them onto our YouTube channel on the, onto our Notion page with past events. I'm gonna paste links into the chat uh, for this. So this is our YouTube channel. This is the link with recordings uh, of uh, all of our uh, past events, as well as notes that people took from there. We'll also be taking notes. Um, taking notes is uh, really important, really helpful for people who uh, couldn't attend the event. So we'll be taking them in this document that I just pasted into the chat. So please uh, help take notes in it collaboratively, uh, like consider what kind of notes you wish you had if you weren't able to attend the event. Uh, so this is really helpful if we can get that done. And um, I think that uh, that's it in terms of the logistics. So with that, uh, on to Amrit or Nikhil, whoever wants to go first. Cool. All right. Thank you, Eugene. Let me share my screen. Here we go. OK, is everyone able to see that? It doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks again, Eugene. Um, I'm Nikhil CTO and co-founder of Axiom Cloud. I'm joined by Armit Robbins, who's a CEO and co-founder of Axiom Cloud. And you know, thanks again to Eugene and uh, Work on Climate for inviting us to talk about what we're up to. Um, I actually just recently enjoy, uh, joined the Work on Climate Slack, and um, I was really, really happy to see a lot of activity on there. And I'm excited to learn about everything the Work on Climate members are up to, um, as well as how I can contribute, you know, how Axiom from Cloud can, can help that out, uh, help the conversation. So feel free to ping me uh, with any questions or comments. All right. Cooling today makes a significant impact on the climate. Not only that, we're heading in a direction that's not neither economically nor oper operational sustainable. Um, more than a quarter of electricity used worldwide is used to make things colder. So in doing so, it accounts for up to 10% global greenhouse gas emissions. So alluding to what, uh, what Eugene was talking about. Um, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, among other factors, exploding middle class in India and China um, and other countries are causing the demand for cooling to soar, uh, projected at 4X in 2050 and 33X by the end of the century. So I mean, there is a lot of demand that we're going to be seeing coming soon at us. There's a clear positive feedback cycle between rising temperatures from greenhouse gas emissions and the demand for more cooling. Um, CNI customers, commercial industrial co customers, use more than a quarter of their electricity for thermal services, and a large portion of that is actually going towards product process or space cooling. Um, and to complicate things further, these cooling systems leak literally all the time. Um, they are complex and tough to maintain. So we've had firsthand experience with this. We once saw um, a small copper line spring a leak because it was vibrating against another line which ground it down into a crack. And these kinds of situations, countless situations like these, cause cooling systems to dump uh, you know, up to 25% of their entire charge every year in the atmosphere. So your, your refrigerator home has something like a few ounces of refrigerant in it. These systems in, in any given grocery store has thousands, you know, set maybe one to 2,000 pounds of refrigerant. And pound for pound, for pound uh, these R gases have hundreds to thousands times of more global warming potential than CO2. Um, so to top that off, there's also gonna be a, an estimated 180,000, uh, a short of 180,000 qualified refrigeration technicians by 2025. So we don't even have the people uh, available in a few years to fix these problems. Um, 
I, I, I went through that really fast. And actually, if you haven't done so already, make sure you check out my next series, awesome talk on food and pharma cold chain. So uh, that was, I think, a couple of weeks ago, hosted by Work on Climate. Um, I watched it. I thought it was fantastic. I learned a lot. And I'm definitely proud to be working on cold chain challenges with companies like Therma. So in the US alone, C9 buildings, so commercial and industrial buildings, spend 120 billion year, per year on energy maintenance. And the 38,000 retail grocery stores across the US, they generate about 700 billion in sales, but 2.1% of that goes towards energy and maintenance. And you can compare that to the razor thin 1.3% average net profit. So saving on those operating expenses would make a huge difference to their bottom line. Cold storage facilities uh, like the million plus square foot regional distribution centers where uh, retail grocery stores get their stuff spend a similar magnitude in electricity and maintenance. And there's also the much broader market in commercial buildings or campuses that have centralized HVAC. So this segment here, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but this segment here is, uh, is our current customers. And we currently have um, more than 80 subscriptions booked um, across six major uh, uh, retail grocers um, and similar cold storage facility providers. So for customers like grocery stores or refrigerated warehouses, a single thermal load, and that means their refrigeration is 55 to up to 90% of all their electric energy consumption. And typically that refrigeration is running 24 seven. It's completely inflexible. So especially as the grid experiences more volatility, there's actually a huge opportunity here to turn that inflexible liability into a flexible asset. Additionally, planned refrigeration outages are actually you know, pretty much a nightmare. So they cause lost sales, angry grocery customers, um, operational headaches, and you know, to, and the worst is a lot of food spoilers. One of those typical grocery stores contains more than $300,000 of perishable goods and they actually begin to spoil within two hours. So unless they act quickly, they're gonna actually have a lot of wastage. Um, and food spoilers across, like this across the, the food cold chain is actually one of the big drivers of cooling system climate impact. So this, mountain of environmental, economic, and operational challenge is what inspired Axiom Cloud's vision to make the world's cooling systems actually sustainable. Our mission is to use software and automation to transform how the world's cooling systems are powered, operated, and maintained in order to generate significant climate and financial impact. We're actually leveraging the proven, the proven playbook of IoT, artificial intelligence, and automation. It's been at really well applied to adjacent industries. And so we're taking that same playbook um, and applying it here to a pretty sleepy industry that hasn't seen really much change in over 100 years. By adding power flexibility and energy storage to cooling systems, we're generating revenue for our customers and enabling higher penetrations of intermittent renewables, so solar and wind. Um, predictive equipment issues and making cooling systems more efficient, we're lowering maintenance costs and reducing the energy required to achieve the same amount of cooling. And by identifying and curtailing refrigerant leaks early, we're helping to reduce the amount of high, high GWP refrigerants released in the atmosphere. So let's take a look. Um, one of the most compelling characteristics of our products is that actually all of the expensive equipment already exists at each site. So we're talking about you know, large racks of compressors, condensers, uh, valves, et cetera, that's already there. We can connect to that refrigeration system, which has a legacy controller, you know, it has a, an operating system behind it. Um, we can connect to that using um, either, either complete remotely uh, from the cloud, or we can attach an on-site gateway. And basically these legacy controllers are, maybe three of them exist um, you know, across the market in Northern America. So we, we're able to integrate with all of them. Um, then we get access to the hundreds of existing sensor set point um, and status data streams that are already in the store. So, you know, there are a lot of distributed sensors in the store that the, the system relies on. We get access to that. However, the system really basically just uses that for its own operation, which is essentially time clock. Um, and so we can take that those streams, both real time and historical and build a physical model or a model of the physical system. Um, the customer then will subscribe to any one of our apps, any one or more of those apps. Facilities Analyzer is actually it is more like a, a way to visualize their data. It empowers customers to see multi-site refrigeration energy data in a single dashboard. 
Um, and then customers can use their own data to proactively identify refrigeration problems and opportunities for improvement. Believe it or not, the state of the industry is such that just getting access to the data in usable ways is a huge step forward for these customers. Um, virtual technician adds a lot to that. Virtual technician automates all, all that work of getting insights from the data and, and can autonomously solve refrigeration, maintenance, and energy problems instead of calling a store manager, uh, instead of the store manager, rather calling a technician every time. And then virtual battery takes that entire system and transforms it into a flexible energy stored asset. So using the refrigeration system data and power meters, weather, grid signals, utility rate plan, it provides um, energy savings and revenue through peak shaving and bulk load shedding. So starting off, let's start off with virtual battery in the hood. Um, the first thing that we do with virtual battery is using those real-time and historical refrigeration system data add weather forecasts to that, and then forecast building refrigeration loads. Um, so you know, making, making a model or making a, an idea as to what that refrigeration load is going to look like and the entire building load as well. Um, then we take an optimizer and it plots essentially the, uh, it, it minimizes objective function and plots the, the, the optimal load profile for saving the customer money, which in this case, um, you know, happily coincides with favorable times to curtail, curtail demand. Depending on the situation with the utility, it'll generate profiles for daily peak shaving. Um, and then in other cases, as well as specific grid uh, demand response events, which would come as some sort of 24 hour signal as an example. Um, here, virtual battery will then prepare for that curtailment, whether it's gonna be peak shaving or the demand response event by pre-cooling low temperature cases. And low temperature cases for grocery are frozen goods. So it doesn't ultimately matter whether the store's ice cream is frozen at positive five Fahrenheit or minus 25 Fahrenheit. You know, there, there's a huge range there. Getting colder is getting colder, um, you know, from the perspective of virtual battery is simply charging the system and it doesn't really affect the end product at all. So just like lithium ion energy storage, virtual battery will use more electricity when favorable, uh, meaning when it's cheaper um, to charge up. And then in refrigeration, that actually means turning on more compressors. So compressors are the engine behind the system and compressors are the highest energy usage devices in that system. So it actually turn on more compressors than are necessary in order to achieve getting that product colder. Um, and then when necessary, virtual battery will load shed. And that's essentially discharging the battery um, according to that optimized profile. So it'll deliberately shut down more compressors than, than would have, or rather it would shut down more compressors and more compressors would have been running at that time uh, than, than are actually running uh, under virtual battery. Um, and that significantly reduces the overall building load most favorable to do so. So um, for, it, it does depend on the size of the building a lot, but you know, we're talking for any given building anywhere from you know, 20, 50, even more kilowatts that we can, we can use to reduce. And this can actually be during any given 15 minute interval, um, which would be the, the, the unit of time that a utility uses to determine uh, demand charges, uh, where the building's exceeding a th threshold or also a several you know, hours long window um, determined by grid signals. So this is actually, uh, this is a great example of virtual battery providing energy goal management or, um, or peak shading. And so, Right around here, uh, starting in the morning, uh, the blue trace here is the actual building power. Um, the gray trace below that and, and kind of imposed on that is the building baseline. So that's what the building would have done um, had virtual battery or an accident cloud not been operating there. And so in the morning, uh, virtual battery, um, anticipating that we're gonna have to do um, peak shading here or, or some sort of you know, lo load shedding, is actually causing the uh, power consumption of the building to go up. So it's turning on more compressors um, and it's actually causing the product to get a lot cooler. So it does that during the day, but it's, it's below some threshold that actually makes a difference. Um, and at the same time, it doesn't exceed system capacity or demand threshold in, in general. It does, and it also doesn't exceed any sort of um, food safety limit, which on the, on the prequel side really isn't a problem. When that building load is starting to peak above this threshold, then virtual battery will actually shut down those same compressors. And so many fewer compressors are running than would otherwise have been running. And we're able to cut down a lot of what the building would otherwise be demanding. Um, so that prequel that we, that we were able to uh, accumulate in the beginning of the day 
allows those cases to float back up in temperature. Um, and we, we do not let those go back, uh, you know, past their set points or past any, um, any food safety uh, threshold. So, so in doing so, we're, we're, we're basically using that stored charge to curtail that load. And in this particular case, this store achieved uh, 28 kilowatts of peak demand for two hours. Uh, so, you know, which, which essentially resulted in um, uh, 55 kilowatt hours of flex capacity. So for two hours, and then a, a pretty hefty total benefit over the month. In, in the same way, um, demand response is, is similar. So once we get some sort of signal from a utility, um, virtual battery will increase the energy consumption of the building, again, pre-cooling the asset. Um, and, and this can happen across the entire fleet. So we're not talking about simply one store, we're talking about several stores or you know, multiple tens, hundreds of stores working in this end. Um, in, during that event, which is gonna be some predetermined period of time based on the grid signal, the compressors are shut down. Um, case temperatures come back to their set points. So again, if you're looking at this, then uh, in, this, in this trace, the blue, is the, the blue is the baseline of the building. Um, the green or that kind of greenish color is the uh, actual refrigeration power. So this is where we actually are versus what it would have been. Um, and then what ends up happening afterward is that you get a recovery period during which the compressors have to run harder than, uh, than they would have otherwise. So that makes sense because we've actually quote unquote depleted the battery um, and we, the system is running a little bit harder than it would have to get back to you know, essentially its nominal state. But in doing so, we get 193 kilowatts of flexible capacity across a five site fleet. Um, and, and so that can multiply quite a lot as the fleet grows. Okay, so the, the, the second app that we offer is virtual technician. You know, as I was talking about before, there's technically there are three apps. Um, and I'm not gonna necessarily, necessarily go into facilities analyzer, which is much more of a visualization tool for the customer to see their data. Um, so taking a look at virtual technician, broad overview is first predicting failures and recognizing set point changes. So this happens all the time. Um, a technician, and, and I'm not, uh, necessarily saying this is wrong, but the technicians will go in, um, they're really, they're, they're stressed out, they have to get to a bunch of jobs. They change the set point that should not be changed. They, they, they say, oh, this case is actually struggling to keep food cold, so they'll just bury the set point, which means we'll just put it really, really low. Um, for, for efficiency purposes and for, um, for, for maintenance purposes, that, that's really bad for the equipment. So what we can do is we can recognize the set point changes, um, forecast ahead as to what the building, or, or rather what those traces, what that case, what that temperature, what that compressor should have been doing and see if there's a, a, a deviation in that. Um, the second thing would be diagnosing the root causes. So there's a combination of machine learning and, um, uh, and, and decision trees that go into diagnosing why this is actually happening rather than just identifying symptoms, which would be a case getting warm or something to that effect, or maybe a compressor shutting off or a condenser fan stopping, uh, not running. Um, for a lot of these things, uh, a lot of the situations that, that we encounter, we can remedy those issues aut autonomously. So changing that set point back to what it should have been. Um, and in some cases, we don't necessarily, we may be able to, uh, we may not be able to do that, but we may be, we will be able to send um, a proper uh, notification to a customer um, with actionable insight as to what to do. Thereafter, the, the last thing that virtual technician would be doing is confirming the resolution of, of uh, that event. So. Um, Instead of not necessarily watching it, making sure that what was uh, what was fixed is actually going to continue to stay fixed. Um, this is a great example of virtual technician refrigerant leak detection. Uh, so, what you're seeing here in these traces would be uh, several cases having with with the temperature traces, and this is over, of course, as you can see, uh, more than a month, and then. This trace here would be what we're picking up from um, a receiver, which is a place where we can store refrigerant um, in the system. So essentially, it's a storage tank for refrigerant, and that will allow us to tell. That essentially allows a virtual technician to determine what the capacity of that system is, or what is the relative change in refrigerant in that system. So while we're tracking receiver level and we're normalizing that with weather, heat load, and other factors, 
there's a slow leak that's happening here. And that leak was invisible to the store's PPM sensors. So there are a limited set of PPM sensors in the store, meaning that they can detect when refrigerant is there uh, based on its concentration in the air. But you know, it, it's difficult to place those sensors everywhere. And, and we're talking about miles and miles worth of piping that goes to, to the stores. So we detected that the, the leak early. Um, as soon as that, that leak was detected, a notification was sent to the store manager and the service provider. Um, so that notification included the estimated impact, the root cause analysis, and links to the relevant data. And in this case, because we can't remotely um, solve a leak, a tech was sent to site to fix the leak um, and also replenish the refrigerant before an unplanned outage. So uh, in one step, we stopped the leak from happening and also made sure that there wasn't some unplanned outage, which, would, which would, could have resulted in food spoilage. Um, and virtual technician at that case, afterwards, we will continue to monitor the system to make sure the root cause of the issue is resolved. So that was actually the, the extent to which I had prepared slides today. Um, I wanted to note that we are, you know, we're, we're definitely hiring. We're looking for um, experienced software engineers, especially a you know, software tech lead um, to join our team. Um, I don't have anything specific on our tech stack, though I'm happy to discuss the tech stack overall. We're, uh, we're a Python house, um, so our entire backend, our data analysis, our, our services are built on Python. Um, it's a microservices architecture running in Kubernetes. Uh, currently, we're actually transitioning from a somewhat custom cloud setup into you know, really native AWS technologies. Um, and, uh, and, and essentially, the rest of the, our, our models are built on top of AWS SageMaker um, using those pipelines. So, um, Eugene, I, I can go into further portions of that um, if, if you think that makes sense. Um, yeah, I think probably like lots of people in the audience here uh, are actually uh, looking for climate work. So, it, it would help if you can like say maybe a little more what it's like to work with you guys. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so we are, and then thanks again for having us and, and uh, allowing us for the opportunity to talk today. Um, Axiom Cloud was just a little bit of back history. We were founded about, uh, at this point, a little more than a year ago. Um, the team that we have has been working together actually longer than that. So a lot of individuals um, came on and we were, you know, we're really lucky to leverage a lot of experiences that we've had with refrigeration and with these technologies from that team to, to really hit the ground running. So um, that seed of a team um, got Axiom Cloud to be able to get the traction that it has. Um, and so at this point, we've also added several more members. So we're approximately 15 people, um, fully remote. We've got a mix of, of software developers, uh, data scientists, computational thermal systems engineers, um, and then a variety of sales and business folks as well. Let's see, working for Axiom Cloud. Uh, like I said, we're fully remote. I think that uh, that makes sense in this pandemic era for, for us. Um, however, you know, we had a lot of rapport when, when our team was working together before in the office too. So uh, really fun social events. Uh, we just had a, um, we had a happy hour just last Friday and, and you know, people do end up meeting up together um, as well. And then as far as the, the working climate, um, I'd say that we have, uh, you know, a really flexible way to work together. Um, I, I, you know, in, in that case, I'd, I'd say that's not necessarily any different than other companies working on Zoom, but I think that we are really, really good at respecting uh, meeting times. We're good at respecting, um, you know, not micromanaging. We really value people working to get working, uh, uh, you know, independently, but also provide a whole lot of um, uh, guidance and direction. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks for this uh, response, Nikhil. So I want to encourage uh, other people to also ask questions either in chat uh, or use the raise your hand uh, feature. Um, I'm not quite sure where that feature is because I'm the host of the meeting, uh, but I think it shouldn't be too hard to find. But meanwhile, um, yeah, Nikhil, could you maybe uh, speak a little bit about the ML methods you guys are using or like ML technologies you use? Uh, what's that like? Yeah, definitely. The good news is that a lot of what we can solve um, can be done with linear regression methods. So uh, that's that's actually just the first step. 
Um, there's a variety of other forecasting methods that we're using. So, so optimization, the, our forecasting methods, um, we can be, we, we have some LSTM models that we're using for that. Um, it, but essentially most of the stack right now is going to be regression modeling and statistical analysis. And, and actually it's, it, it's, it's gonna be, it's an interesting time to get here because we're able to get to the stage we are today using relatively simple methodologies, but um, there's a variety of things that are on the horizon that will uh, be really exciting to join on as someone who's interested in data science. Yeah, very cool. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I guess is, uh, I wonder like why does uh, linear regression work so well there? Like, is this like one of the cases where there's just so much headroom uh, compared to the state of the art uh, that even simple methods get a lot of bang for the buck? Yeah, that's right. That's actually right. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it does work well in those cases and we're able to say, for example, generate baseline models using those methodologies. Mm -hmm. um, the, and that, like I said, that is good enough, quote unquote. The big challenge is when we start to see really, really large and fast changes in, in what's happening in the industry. So the pandemic is one great example in that uh, the, the usage patterns of the buildings really, really changed as the pandemic rolled through. So historical data really wasn't something that would, would very accurately represent um, what the building looked to be. And then, uh, and then also adding to that would be uh, really changing grid patterns as well. So, so in some cases we have stores that, are, that have solar um, on them. And so when the grid prices for those stores go negative, the question is, what do we do with those? And those are something that, that wasn't really reflected um, in years past. So on the one hand, yes, it works well uh, because we, because like I said, it does, it does do a lot given the state of the art today. Um, on the other hand, no, there's a lot of changing things that we need to address using more specific models. Got it. Um... Wow, that's uh, that's pretty cool. So, can you tell a little more about like what does happen when energy prices go negative? Like, how does it affect what your controllers must do? Yeah, good question. Um, it depends. So, so it, it kind of depends on the energy system that we're dealing with. Um, for the most part, the modeling that we do will net out what that energy system is doing. Um, the CNI customers will still be paying the same amount um, given. Uh, given, given essentially that the utility is going to have a pretty static profile when it comes to uh, cost. So um, we're, we, we, in order to get the model to work right now, we're going to be, we net out that result. Um, moving forward, we're going to have to have more sophisticated methodology in incorporating those. Got it. So uh, Nick Linson had a question. Uh, Nick, do you want to unmute yourself and ask? Sure, uh, thank you. Um, I was curious about uh, Axiom's kind of maturity around um, using your alg algorithms to control equipment in for utility demand response or you know RTO ISO demand response programs. I was wondering if it's still at the R and D stage, uh, you know, at particular utilities or organizations, or if it's actually being uh, commercially used by large grocery chains in particular locations. Any more details you can provide would be of interest. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'll take a first stab at that. I'm sure Amrit has, has something to say about that as well, but commercially used. We are commercially using them for active customers. Um, we have successfully done um, many demand response, response events, especially this summer and past summers. So um, we're able to respond to specific uh, grid signals and we're able to curtail demand across the entire fleet. Yeah, uh, this is Amrit speaking. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Axiom. Uh, pleasure to connect folks. So just adding on to what Nikhil said there, um, yeah, demand response is, it's definitely a part of the model. It's been interesting because it is a really good opportunity that kind of gets folks' attention, gets customers' attention, and enables us to get into new accounts uh, because people are, are familiar with demand response. But in terms of the magnitude of that value stream, it's actually much smaller than most of the other value streams we deliver. So, you know, for example, with virtual battery, um, if we're doing demand response for a customer, that's maybe on the order of 10 to 20% of the overall value that we're able to provide using the virtual battery app. The other 80 or 90% is coming from reducing their electricity bills through peak shaving um, and essentially uh, reducing peak demand, reducing demand charges. So um, it, it is a kind of splashy and well-known opportunity uh, that enables us to get in, in front of customers 
and get contracts closed, but ultimately the majority of the value is coming from other value streams, ironically. Makes sense, yeah. Uh, so uh, also like a, a question about uh, reducing reducing energy bills. Uh, like, could you speak a little bit about how that correlates with reducing emissions? Like in the places where you operate, does reducing energy uh, cost correspond to like times when the grid is cleaner or dirtier or like how do you expect that to change over time? Yeah, um, so currently uh, for, for those for those utilities that uh, that have favorable um, rate structures for um, energy bill management, they have a pretty fixed rate structure. So there's there's gonna be time of use rates. Um, I'm not sure how familiar with the group is with time of use, but it's just just in a, in, a, in a nutshell, that means that during a certain time of the day, which which in PG&E territory would be 4 p.m. to 9 p.m., um, it's much more expensive to use energy, and particularly it's much more expensive if you have your, your demand. So essentially, the demand will will uh, will will ratchet up to a certain number, and that's what you pay for for that month, mm -hmm. uh, even if it was only for a 15 minute interval. Um, mm -hmm. There is a there is a correlation between when those time of use rates um, are higher and when grid demand is highest. You know, when peaker plants are going off, when when the grid is strained, and, and therefore. The, the price signal is something that we're following to, you know, because that's when we need to curtail load, uh, which coincides with and load should be curtailed from an environmental perspective. Um, that we can extend that to um, markets in, that have real time pricing. So, um, given that there is a real time pricing signal, um, assuming that we that one exists, then we will also be able to respond to that um, so that in the same way we'll be able to reduce energy. Uh, uh, cost of the energy bill, but also respond to specifically when the grid intensity is too much, carbon intensity is too high, and and you know it, it essentially manifests as as a price signal. Got it. I'm I'm wondering like how have you guys looked at um, have you tried actually doing the analysis of like how much emissions you may have saved in certain scenarios? Yeah, in interesting you say that. We've we've done that is actually part of our our roadmap to do portion of analysis. So that's something in progress. Do you have okay. something to say, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, impact is, it's the reason that, that I'm here, um, you know, climate impact. And so this is, it's also a reason that a lot of our team members are working with the company. And so, you know, this, one of our key stakeholders, there's, you know, the, the four key stakeholders that we work for are the planet, uh, our customers, our employees, and our investors. Um, and so we're always thinking in terms of those four key stakeholders. When it comes to the planet, you know, one of our, our OKRs is essentially, you know, our, our strategic multi-year OKRs. Um, is around defining the climate impact of each marginal project and each marginal app deployment, and then publicly sharing that um, to hold ourselves accountable uh, and to make sure that whatever we're building does have that positive climate impact that you know, we, we, we understand and we know that it does, but we have not taken the time to quantify it yet. Mm -hmm. um, I actually wanted to come back to some of the, uh, the impact question here when it comes to emissions for individual projects. I would actually, so in, in California, for example, the grid carbon intensity, that signal is now available uh, via a contractor through the, uh, the SGIP program in California, every five minutes, I believe, or every 15. Um, and so, you know, looking at those carbon intensity uh, measures, it, it is clear that we're reducing carbon a little bit, uh, just like any other kind of load shifting or demand peak shaving technology. But I would actually argue that that's more of a secondary effect. Uh, the primary impact that we're having is that we are taking the overall electricity grid infrastructure and market and making it more flexible and more intelligent. And so what that enables us to do as a society, even though this is much more difficult to quantify, is basically it enables the interconnection of more intermittent solar, more intermittent wind, more intermittent electric car charging without running into major, you know, kind of showstopper stability issues. Um, and so I would argue that that is the primary impact that we're having. And a lot of these DER, distributed energy resource companies out there are having today is really just about enabling that grid to actually, uh, you know, actually um, enable all those intermittent consumers and producers of electricity without becoming destabilized and leading to blackouts. That's an incredibly difficult thing to quantify though. So, um, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That's, uh, that's really interesting. And, uh, I guess like even in terms of emissions, like it's clear that you have the, the algorithms that can optimize for a forecast metric of cost. And, uh, 
yeah, uh, like it's clearly applicable to emissions as well. Yeah, assuming that cost, assuming the market is pricing emissions properly, then we're in great shape. But uh, that's a tough assumption to make a lot of times. Yeah, makes sense. So uh, next question from Lily. Lily, uh, would you like to unmute, unmute and ask? Um, yeah, sure. First of all, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to ask more about supermarkets and refrigeration. So I just read that 50 to 60% of their electricity bill actually comes from refrigeration, which is quite a lot. So I'm wondering how do supermarkets um, manage produce overnight? Do they then take it out of the refrigeration and store it in a separate cooler or do they keep the refrigeration systems running overnight? Thank you. They, I mean, they essentially keep everything running overnight. They have to. Uh, so supermarkets can do some things to help um, basically reduce the load associated with refrigeration overnight. Uh, they can close doors. They can put um, basically curtains over those open air cases that you reach in and get produce. Um, and then in some cases, in some situ situations, they'll take the produce off the shelf and put it into a, a back cooler, you know, where the door will stay shut um, just to make sure that the temperature will stay more stable. But otherwise they have to keep it refrigerated. There's no way around it. And, and the system will be running at night. Right, and I read in this article that apparently Trader Joe's has the worst performance when it comes to like energy and efficiency. Um, so, so exactly what are they doing wrong and why is Whole Foods so much more sustainable compared to them? I'm not sure if you know about that, but maybe, perhaps not. That's interesting. I didn't actually know that about, about Trader Joe's versus Whole Foods. Uh, it's, it's possible that, I mean, for, for the one part, uh, Trader Joe's are smaller stores. They use different technologies. Sometimes they use distributed technologies, which may not be as efficient as centralized ones. Um, it's also possible that Whole Foods is, you know, is just more, much more diligent about putting, first of all, they might have uh, doors on cases. Uh, even Trader Joe's doesn't have any cases like that. In fact, I think they just have what they call coffin types, which is just the ones you reach into. Um, you know, there's a bunch of frozen goods and they may not be able to put anything on top of that, whereas Whole Foods might has a lot of cases that are more vertical and then they have doors on them. Um, and it could be just a matter of operation as well that Whole Foods, so the difference, you know, one, one major difference being that Whole Foods has, has had a charter for sustainability, um, and, and, you know, kind of corporate interest in that. And so having tighter procedures around, uh, keeping their food, uh, colder, or rather keeping their food tighter, uh, um, you know, and, and under better refrigeration might be contributing to that. Um, but Amr actually is because, Amr, do you have anything to say about that? I don't have a great answer for that. Um, but it is yeah, I didn't realize that either. I, I've heard that obviously Trader Joe's has had some recent headlines around big refrigerant leaks, uh, but I didn't realize that they did kind of have a reputation for being more sustainable or less sustainable, sorry. Right, so I also wanted to ask, where do these leaks typically come from? Everywhere. Um, <laughs> like literally, so so just, just to get an idea in your head of, of what these central refrigeration systems look like, they are, uh, maybe you know a rack about you know maybe five feet tall six feet tall and and eight ten twelve feet long of compressors with just turbo machinery sitting there in a back room and then hundreds of pipes going from from that centralized source spidering across uh the the entire supermarket so if you, if you the next time you go into a supermarket you'll you'll notice that especially with uh the aisles of frozen goods there's gonna be some drop downs coming from the ceilings and columns. And that's where all the refrigeration pipes are coming down to. Um, and so the, the leaks can occur anywhere along that entire system from the, from the machine itself to all the interconnections to the cases. Uh, and the cases will have essentially the same thing that's in your, in your refrigerator, which would be valve and, and, uh, and a, uh, an evaporator coil um, and, you know, all, and fans and things like that. So um, anywhere along those copper lines is where those leaks occur. The, the leak detection systems, um, are mostly concentrated in the back room. Um, so where, where the larger equipment is, and it's really, really tough to have leak detection uh, distributed across the store. Got it. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, I just uh, posted uh, a link to climate-friendly supermarkets.org, which has like a, a rating, I think, of supermarkets according to their attitude towards HFC leaks. And yeah, Trader Joe's is like really not doing well. I think they uh, I think they got sued for it uh, and have had to pay something up, but uh, that's not quite a replacement for fixing things yet. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so uh, next question from Jason uh, Ayres, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, Jason, uh, can you unmute and ask? Yeah, thank you. Um, great presentation, um, Amit and the team. You talked about load, load shedding and uh, 
talked about the low temperature of the frozen side because there's more thermal mass and opportunity to keep that product stable. Um, within a food supermarket, and Lily just touched on it, fridge loads 60 to 70 percent. The medium temperature usually equates to more of that energy proportion. Um, what challenges or thoughts in load shedding on that side? I'm more, obviously, there's more influences with temperature, food safety, etc. Have you started to look at that area yet, or is it, or are you struggling with challenges as well? Just interested to see your roadmap there. You are absolutely right. So it is much more of a challenge to do medium temperature um, load shedding and uh, basically man manipulations. The medium temperature being your fresh produce. Um, so that obviously has to stay above freezing and then it's got a narrow temperature range in which it can stay uh, viable as a product. Um, the, the short answer, it is achievable. We can do this. We can load shed with those systems. We have to be extra careful. Uh, the One of the biggest limitations in the industry is that the, the feedback system for determining whether your, system, whether your cases are healthy and therefore your produce would be the air temperature. So all the, the these cases have sensors which are either at the discharge or the, the return of the air that's circulating through those cases. And it's looking just at the air temperature of the case, not at the food temperature itself. So um, just a little bit of change in the amount of refrigerant going to that case, or maybe you know, some, some sort of load going into it, such as quote unquote hot uh, product, uh, will actually cause that air temperature to change a lot. Um, and because of that, you know, we're, we're monitoring that air temperature as an indicator of where we're at in terms of the, the case health. Because of that, um, it's really difficult to change, uh, to change, to modulate the medium temperature load because if that temperature rises up, uh, then that's taken as an indication that the food may spoil. Whereas the food temperature itself, the product temperature, the physical food may not be changing that much. So uh, the challenge there is actually changing the, you know, one, changing the, the, the perception about whether air temperature equates to product temperature and doing something about it. You know, that means maybe putting sensors in there in the, in the food product itself. Um, and then two, obviously staying within those bounds and making sure that we don't damage that produce. And so right, right this moment in, from a, you know, commercially, we're not doing the medium temperature modulation, but looking, you know, and we're able to, we are able to leverage it if necessary. Okay. Thank you for that. I think the challenges of, of that, maybe doors on cases might help a little bit longer by keeping that air influence. And I hear what you're saying. You need a product probe in there, not an air probe. And that, right. I think that might help. But uh, interesting. I hear the challenges. Thank you. I have uh, uh, one more question. So uh, you guys are currently operating mostly in North America, is that right? Um, I, I'm wondering, like, what are you, uh, what are your plans in regards to like entering the parts of the world that maybe don't have refrigeration at all for the most part yet? Um, yeah, uh, like, are the challenges there different or similar to what you're seeing with like existing legacy refrigeration systems? So parts of the world that that don't yet have a set of, like a retail uh, grocery system set up. Yeah, basically, um, like there are uh, in a certain parts of the world where refrigeration is not as common um, or like refrigeration equipment not not as available. So as they onboard refrigeration equipment, like are the challenges they will see with like adding new equipment similar to what you're seeing here, or like do people mostly use different equipment now that has different challenges for new installations? Hmm, Amrit, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So basically, um, you know, kind of like you mentioned, Eugene, in, in the more developed parts of the world, we're dealing with really standard, big, central legacy equipment. Um, and we're helping to bring that into the 21st century connected to the internet. Um, when you're talking about parts of the world that don't have a really robust cold chain already, um, that's a real, it's a completely different set of challenges. Um, there are some similarities. So, um, you know, for one, the cold chain is coming. Uh, it's like a freight train. There's no stopping it. Um, it is here to stay, uh, no matter how retail changes in the developed world, no matter kind of what the different market or, or kind of cultural trends are in just about any part of the world, the cold chain is coming. Um, it's, it's very difficult to, to argue with that. Um, and, and the data does support that as well. Um, and ultimately, the, the types of challenges on the maintenance side are going to be somewhat similar. Um, so, you know, you always need to maintain refrigeration. This is not a set it and forget it type of machinery, type of equipment. 
Um, and so from that perspective, the ability to use remote access, uh, remote uh, data monitoring and analysis and root cause detection and things like that, those types of solutions are gonna be incredibly applicable um, even in the developing world in these, in these new areas. Where it becomes a little bit uh, less applicable is probably more on the energy side where uh, while these grids are much weaker in different parts of the developing world, um, they don't have the infrastructure in place really to enable um, you know, profitable use of load shedding or peak shaving or demand response and things like that. It just doesn't exist in a lot of parts of the world. And so uh, what that means is that, you know, uh, basically buildings could do it out of the goodness of their hearts, but there would not be a really strong financial reason for them to do it. And um, arguably that means it's not going to be done that often. Um, and so uh, instead, the problem that a lot of these other places are facing has to do with weak grids rather than optimizing versus unoptimized grids. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we're talking about a weak grid application of cold chain, that's where things get really, really tricky. And we've thought a lot about how Axiom could play a role in that type of scenario where, you know, uh, basically a, a group of people want a cold chain, but the grid can't, is not reliable enough to support it. And at this point, uh, we have some ideas, but we don't exactly have clarity on what that product may look like in order to help support that sort of application. Uh, it very well may involve pre-cooling and load shedding, though, especially if we're able to in some way predict those grid outages ahead of time and prepare for them. So just a little teaser about what could be, uh, but we don't really have a strong, coherent answer on that question quite yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, that's really interesting. Yeah, I I did not realize just like how uh, I mean obviously the grid is different, but yeah, like this wasn't on my mind. So thank you for explaining that. Um, I'd like to quickly, quick, I mean, you know, a lot of the challenges are going to be same, as Amr was saying. A lot they'll be a lot of the same because. Vapor compression as a technology um, to pr produce cooling is not going to change um, anytime soon for, you know, especially for the technology cycle for them to actually uh, to in install these things. I mean, they're not going to be um, installing pie in the sky technology. It's going to be something that's proven. So we're going to be dealing with those same challenges. Uh, and that means, again, going back to the whole, the whole leak situation, refrigerant flowing through these pipes, et cetera. Um, one place that we could make a difference would be the controller. Um, so rather than having to deal with interfacing with a legacy control that was not built to do these things, frankly, was not built to have, um, you know, kind of a more intelligent system on top of it and, and modulating things on and off. It was, it was just built to run and just run in one, you know, one or two kinds of ways. Uh, we could influence uh, basically the, uh, the control of that system at a, at a much base, you know, a much more basic level. Mm -hmm. um, which would enable fast responses, which would enable a lot higher level integration, a lot cleaner integration, as an example. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's something that, that, you know, I'd say that's not necessarily on the product roadmap um, in the near future, but you know, we would certainly consider um, given the opportunity. So, so uh, you're, you're saying that basically if you had the opportunity to install different controllers, you would be able to like shave even more, uh, have faster response cycles and shave more energy off. Yeah, yeah, we'd have much, much more, much finer control over the equipment. I mean, right now, basically, it's it's a question of how much can we, how much can we properly talk to that equipment versus how much is it fighting us, literally, in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so having much better integration with that equipment would would mean uh, much finer control when you know, mm -hmm. have most likely better outcomes. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Uh, thank you. Um, um, more questions from people. I mean, there is more stuff that I, I can ask, but I would like to encourage people to. Uh, Ask more too. Um, okay, I'll, I'll ask one more question. Um, meanwhile, myself. So, could you maybe speak a little bit to the differences in, I guess, the challenges of re reducing refrigeration emissions across the different use cases of refrigeration, like grocery stores versus like cold transportation versus HVAC uh, in buildings, like uh, cooling down buildings. Like which of these are you uh, tackling? I think you spoke a little bit to that, but uh, could you uh, clarify that a little? Yeah, uh, you want me to take this one, Nikhil? Sure. Yeah, so we're starting at the end of the cold chain on the retail grocery side. Um, the next step is climbing our way back up the cold chain. Um, so we, we have our very first customer right now in the refrigerated warehouse, our cold storage space. Um, and that deployment is in progress. We're really excited about that. Um, once we get that win on the board, that case study published, 
Um, we're hoping that's going to give us basically a, a really strong beachhead into the cold storage space. Again, very similar value streams, basically uh, save money, uh, be sustainable and uh, reduce headaches. Um, and ultimately, uh, it comes down to, you know, the, the same use cases, the same types of technologies, the same applications that we're doing for retail grocery, um, albeit with modifications for the needs of that particular customer segment. Um, from there, the next, the next place where we're going is uh, basically continuing to climb up the cold chain into food processing, packaging, manufacturing. Uh, so, you know, there's tens of thousands of facilities across the country that have massive central refrigeration systems. And that's our bread and butter right now. Um, we also are beginning now to kind of dip our toes in the water on the HVAC side of the house. So dealing with space cooling, comfort cooling, and, and comfort heating as well um, in, our, in the current customer segments that we're serving. So that's how we're beginning to learn and bridge that gap into, um, you know, in, into the, the other technology segment there. And so uh, eventually the hypothesis is that we're going to be able to take all these learnings that we've had and all this experience and this, and this market uh, essentially momentum and apply it also to commercial buildings, starting with uh, larger commercial buildings that have central plants um, or campuses even uh, that have central plants. So in the, they look very similar to a refrigeration system in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, and so then applying very similar value propositions in those markets as well. Got it. And uh, what about cold transportation? Like, does it have any, you know, emissions that can be saved there or is it like relatively fixed? Yeah, there's definitely big opportunities in transportation. Um, that one is, it's on our roadmap, but it's very, very far out. Um, we believe that basically where we can have the most impact right now is taking this, you know, massive number of facilities with huge central refrigeration systems and making them visible, making them intelligent, making them flexible, uh, making them not break as frequently. So that, that's really where we're focusing our attention today. Getting into mobile applications, I think could be a completely different company, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a different market, a different set of challenges, different set of players. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, thank you. Thank you, I'm written Nikhil. So we're, we're nearing the end of the time slot. So uh, if, yeah, we we'll probably have time for one more question. Uh, but uh, other, other than that, yeah, just want to thank, uh, thank the speakers and uh, remind that we have a, a sort of time-honored tradition that after an event, uh, we encourage people to post something they learned uh, from the event. There will be a thread, uh, just post it onto the event thread uh, on uh, the event's official Slack channel. Um, yeah, I'll create the thread right after the event. Um, please post something uh, there. Like it's both a great way to sort of solidify the knowledge in your head and uh, sort of show to the speaker uh, like what uh, what stood out to you from the talk and basically like a way to thank the speaker by showing that you remembered something. Hey, Eugene, is that also a good place for us to post uh, the job openings that we have? Because, you know, our goal today is really to meet some, you know, really smart, motivated, excited mm -hmm. folks mm -hmm. and um, ideally convince one or two to come and join our team. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah, that, that is a good place to do that. Uh, also, you can also post uh, on jobs, uh, on the jobs channel. So yeah, feel free to do both. Awesome. Thanks so much for the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Mm -hmm.